Good morning and welcome to this, the first meeting of 2015 of the European and External Relations Committee. Um, can I make the usual request that mobile phones are switched off? Our first agenda item this morning is to welcome Anne McTaggart to the committee. Welcome Anne, I hope you enjoy your time on the committee. Um, we're certainly uh, doing a lot of very interesting work, I'm sure you'll find it. Um, interesting for yourself. And can we take this opportunity to thank Alec Rowley for his contributions to the committee? Um, I'm sure uh, Alec's legacy of looking at uh, ferries and other infrastructure projects through the committee uh, in relation to Europe will, will, will carry on into the, the next year. Um, and could I invite you to make any declaration in relation to this committee? Thank you, Chair, um, and I'm pleased to be here. And just really to refer people to my register of interest. Okay, no other... Thank you very much. And can we invite this morning uh, uh, Jean Urquhart to committee, who has a long-standing interest in this topic. Um, welcome, Jean. You're, you're more than welcome to contribute, if you so wish. Um, so moving on to agenda item two, which is the purpose of our meeting this morning um, and our inquiry on the transatlantic trade and investment partnership. Um, uh, delighted to extend a very warm welcome, well it's a bit of a cold and blowy welcome from Edinburgh uh, today to Mr Hido Huben, who is the Deputy Chief Negotiator for the European Commission and who is joining us this week by video conference from Brussels. Good morning Mr Huben. I think um, to get the Deputy Chief Negotiator on this topic is a real win for our committee, so we're delighted to have you here this morning and very, very interested in what you have to say. Um, I believe you have an opening statement. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. McKelvey. Uh, let me first of all say that uh, I would have preferred to actually be with you uh, in, uh, in Edinburgh. Uh, I think most of us still see uh, a trip to Edinburgh as combining a lot of things uh, that we like. Uh, so if I had been able, I would have uh, I would have come. So I apologize to having to do this by uh, video uh, conference. Um, and uh, maybe just to introduce myself very briefly. <clears throat> My name is Hido Huben. I'm a Dutch national. I've been working in the commission for about 25 years, uh, mainly on international trade policy. And I've been based in, I was the head of our economic department in the embassy, in the European embassy in Washington for five years. And I've just returned as of September, where here I lead uh, a small department who work uh, on uh, the TTIP uh, negotiations. And it's a great pleasure to be with you, uh, even if it's just by video. Uh, and I just wanted to maybe say, uh, very briefly, just a few points, and then really to leave the space uh, for you and your colleagues so that any questions that you may have, uh, you can put them to me, and I will try uh, as best I can to uh, to respond. Um, and then we can just take it, uh, take it uh, from there. Um, but I just wanted to say a, a few things. We have, of course, a new commission since... Uh, uh, November, a new uh, leadership, a new Commissioner for Trade, and one of the first things that uh, this Commissioner, uh, Cecilia Malmström, who is a Swedish uh, national, has done is she has increased the transparency. Yep. Sorry, sorry, we're, we're losing the sound from you. Um, ah. Okay. Does this help? Does this help? No, I think maybe we'll suspend slightly for our technical people to, to um, address the issue. Suspend slightly. Thank you. Hi there. Hello. Is it better now? Uh, no, it it was, we're still getting a frying noise. I think it might be a microphone connection. That's it. That's it gone now. That's clean now. Can you speak to me, please? Can you hear me now? Ah, uh, no, it's... It comes on quite... 
Let me see, because uh, I think it is at your end. The problems we think are at your end and not at our end. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you clearly now. Ah, okay. So we that, seem to have solved it. That sounds so much better. Yes, aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. But well, to carry wonderful. on then. So, <laughs> all right. Well, it's oh, oh no, for that. no, no, no. It's, it's, it's perhaps when you move in your chair, is there a cable or something that um, you're disturbing? or? Not that I can see. But oh. we have... Uh, we have each other again. We have, yes. So, okay, so I will just, uh, I was just very briefly trying to just highlight a few points on which I thought you as members of the uh, committee would might have a specific interest. Uh, they are uh, on the transparency of the negotiations, just to flag to you that we have launched a transparency initiative uh, two weeks ago, as a result of which... Um, all of the negotiating texts uh, are now available on the internet. So any of you uh, who want to see the actual texts of what we negotiate, these are available and they are accompanied by fact sheets, by uh, subjects. So uh, that should help you uh, forward in terms of actually interacting on the uh, on the substance and of course we are in your hands uh, as are uh, you know uh, the uh, or my colleagues working in London at the uh, at the BIS uh, to help you with any specific uh, requests you have I mean we are of course very conscious if we think of Scotland that a lot of uh, the products you export uh, or are very competitive in uh, have a strong interaction with trade policy. I mean, if, you, if we, for example, just take spirits as an example, uh, spirits historically have faced uh, very, very high trade barriers uh, in international trade. And I think at the European level, we've been very successful over the last 30 years to actually open foreign markets to, uh, to exports of spirits. And you'll see that in most markets of the world, Exports are free of duties if you are a whiskey producer or an other spirits producer. And uh, the same applies to other products like textiles, where you make high quality textile products. Um, and I think that the way we see TTIP is that TTIP actually takes this to a next level. It is also has an ambitious services component. So uh, services, international trade commitments to open services sectors are not as developed as for manufactured goods. So TTIP intends to sort of move the needle uh, and to open those uh, uh, markets. Uh, the energy sector uh, is uh, historically also less open than others. Um, and uh, that is also an area where TTIP uh, wants to provide a significant uh, market opening. Um, and so uh, I think that in, in all of those respects, uh, what we do as trade negotiators on behalf of uh, the European uh, member states, regions, economies, is to really work to open markets in order to uh, serve high uh, paid jobs uh, in uh, our different uh, regions and member states across Europe. Generally speaking, uh, jobs that depend on exports are more well paid uh, than uh, jobs that are uh, for people who just work for the domestic economy. So trade-related jobs usually are uh, high quality. They require, of course, uh, often a uh, very well-qualified uh, workforce, but it's usually a very uh, good uh, stimulus for the economy. And, of course, the important thing about market opening is it doesn't cost any fiscal... Uh, 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 there's no fiscal uh, weight uh, when you take a trade liberalisation initiative. So you're creating jobs 
without actually increasing uh, 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 government, uh, government spending. <clears throat> and that's very important. There are a few things, I think, maybe in concluding that I should say, and then really any question that you may have, I think you should feel free to uh, try it on me. I'm not sure I'll be able to answer uh, all of it, but I, can, I will really do my, my very best. Um, we are, of course, aware in Brussels of the specific situation regarding health care uh, in Scotland, in Wales, in other parts uh, in which you have a specific responsibility uh, that is uh, proper to Scotland. And so any questions that you may have in that regard, I would be happy to try to, to respond uh, to that. Uh, the final point I would make is on one specific item, which is maybe the most controversial one in TTIP at this point in time, which is this often quoted uh, investment uh, uh, dispute settlement mechanism, which allows uh, an investor to take uh, a government to court or to an uh, arbitration tribunal. It's actually not a court, uh, uh, not a formal court, in case he, he, he feels that he has been discriminated against in relation to a domestic in, in investor. And the only thing I can say there is that we published yesterday, so the timing of today's meeting is actually quite fortuitous, uh, we published yesterday the outcome of our uh, consultation on this uh, instrument. It's available on the web. We would be happy to send it to you if, if you want. It's a 150-page document uh, full of uh, legalisms, but it includes a number of recommendations on three or four pages in which basically we've, we've identified the core problems and the core issues uh, and they, and on the basis of those core issues, I think the Commission intends to now interact with the European Parliament, our member states, so the 28 uh, uh, member states, and stakeholders writ large. And this is a process that we envisage will take about three months. Uh, and we hope, uh, I would say by around April, May, to be able to condense that into a policy recommendation as to First of all, whether, and then secondly, if so, what kind of investment dispute settlement mechanism uh, is appropriate uh, to negotiate with uh, uh, our American friends. Now, the only thing I would say in concluding is that, of course, all of these things are uh, hugely important, but they don't take place in a vacuum. So whatever we decide with our very complex processes in Brussels, because we try to take account of different member states, of the European Parliament, of the Council, of civil society, we still also subsequently have to negotiate that with our American counterparts. And as you can imagine, they have a lot of advantages that we don't have because they have a you know, very strong federated system of government. So they have one voice one negotiator, uh, it's much more centralized than our European system. So whatever outcome we come with uh, 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 in our interaction with the United States subsequently still depends, of course, on the feedback we receive from them and on the way that the Americans define their priorities for their negotiation with, uh, with Europe. And I think, broadly speaking, we can say that we have... Uh, similar interests. We both need growth. Uh, America needs growth as much as we do. We both need competitiveness because we're facing huge competitive challenge from Asia and that will remain in the next 10 to 15 years. So this is an agreement in which we can help each other uh, become more competitive. But of course, like all very, very large trade negotiations, there's also aspects where we have offensive interests where they are defensive and vice versa. And we also have areas where we basically will not be wishing to change European policy in the same way as there are areas on the American side where they will not be wanting to change American policy. So I think with that, maybe a last comment. Uh, these negotiations are far from concluded. 
we're now about to get into the real meat of the negotiation. Uh, we have said that we hope we may be able to conclude these with the Obama administration. Uh, that is an administration that is still has uh, uh, two years uh, to go. It's, it, it's not uh, a certainty that we will be able to do that, but we are going to try. We have a commissioner who is very free trade oriented, Cecilia Malmstrom, so she's going to put her best foot forward and try, but we have to come, we can only envisage this if the outcome is balanced and if it really finds support among broad categories of the European population. And I think currently the general feeling at the political level is that there is still too much controversy. So we need to work through some of the more controversial elements uh, so that we can, uh, we, can, we can build a broader support of consensus of people who feel that this is the right thing to do. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you very much. That was uh, very extensive and you answered some of the first questions that I had in mind about progress and timetable and, and, and things like that. I had um, the, the pleasure on Saturday to meet a representative of the Canadian government, um, Greg Houlihan, who had been involved in the Canadian agreement. And given uh, you know, the recognition from the Commission that this whole TTIP negotiation is surrounded by controversy, and I understand that the, the uh, contributions to the consultation have been within the hundred thousands um, of uh, people putting in their, their concerns and their ideas. Um, I wonder if, if you were involved in the Canadian side of their agreement, because I know that theirs is signed. And you know, on the opinion of Mr Houlihan, they managed to resolve all of the issues and the controversies that, that this TTIP agreement is now facing. Um, and I wonder if you've got any information you can give us and what lessons have been learned from that and how you would foresee using those lessons to take forward resolving some of the issues and the controversies around the current TTIP um, arrangements. Yes, uh, and thank you very much because... Uh, I mean, the point you raise is, is, at least in political terms, it is the most, uh, the most sensitive one uh, currently, which is, you know, well, what do we do with this uh, investment uh, mechanism, and does it belong in an agreement with the United States? And there are lots of, you know, I think legitimate questions that people have. Uh, Americans are, poor, are more litigative in their uh, societal structures. They, they, they litigate more than we do. Um, and, uh, you know, there are, there are legitimate questions as if in, you know, very established legal jurisdictions like Europe and America, if you really need an instrument of this kind. So the question, putting the question is, uh, is legitimate. Of course, uh, I'm a trade specialist. I look at macroeconomics. My main job is to contribute to, to, to jobs and growth. And Sorry, Mr. Mr. Hubin, I think yes. we're going to have to suspend again. We're losing you again. <laughs> we'll go oh, let me just see. Uh, what is, uh, is this helping? Let me just see. Uh, no. Uh, gosh. Is this helping? Can you hear me? Yeah. Right. I, I, we can, can hear you, but there's a noise that appears uh, over your voice, um, a distortion of some sort. I don't know if there's other um, devices in the room that could be causing that, or maybe your phone, which if you could maybe switch that off, that might help. Is this better? Yeah. There's no papers sitting on Is top of the mic. There's no papers sitting, no. leaning on the microphone or anything like that? No. There's nothing. I'm trying, we're moving everything out. I don't have any phones around. Uh, I'm very sorry. Uh, I really should have come to Edinburgh. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. No, no, we should have come to Edinburgh. Uh, you'd be welcome to come here if ever you wish. Uh, you know, if ever you wish to do a field trip and meet, uh, you know, uh, I know that MEPs, of course, from Scotland have been... Uh, uh, interacting with you, but if ever you wish to do a field trip, you know, not just on TTIP, but also on other issues, you really should feel free to let us know, uh, and we'd be more than happy to, uh, to roll out the red, uh, the red carpet uh, for you, because we really see this as, as you know, a core task 
uh, to interact also with uh, with parliaments like uh, like yours. Thank you okay. very much. I think maybe um, we'll keep our fingers crossed. It sounds quite clean just now, and we'll we'll continue. Okay. Yeah, coming through nice and clear now. So we'll, we'll restart the okay. restart the committee, and you can finish your your response. <laughs> Right. Okay. So I was just uh, responding to your question on the, the investment instrument. Uh, uh, the, I think the questions are legitimate, uh, and uh, it's political. I think people on the on the left, more on the left wing, are slightly more critical, and people more on the right wing are uh, slightly more favourable. Uh, I'm a trade policy specialist, and of course, if I look at say European what is the European in interest over the longer term, we also have to look at these investment instruments uh, in a larger context. Because if we don't have an instrument of this kind with the United States, it will be more difficult to request this of the Indians, uh, of the Chinese, of the Russians, etc. Because the agreement between Europe and America really is a standard setting agreement, uh, which will be seen as such uh, by uh, other partners in the world. And so that is uh, an important component. Uh, it, 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 it's not the decisive component, but it's an important one. I think what is fair to say about investment is this. Most of, the, uh, of these investment instruments around the world are actually, they belong to European member states. So. It's one of those paradoxes of politics which you come across every now and then. Uh, there's a huge controversy around the investment instrument, but actually if you look at uh, around the world, the countries that have these instruments most of all are European member states, including the UK, uh, including uh, Germany, including France, including smaller EU member states like Holland, where I come from. And we are the largest users uh, across the world of investment dispute settlement, not just for big business, also for small and medium-sized enterprises. About one quarter of cases that we launch are launched by small SMEs. Uh, and the only important thing to bear in mind there is that if you are an SME and you have a problem on a third country market, you can activate an instrument like this, but it's less likely that government-to-government -government dispute settlement will work to solve your problem as an SME. So the public perception that this investment instrument really only helps big business is not completely on target. That's the first point. The second point is that the Canada agreement to which you refer, uh, to which you've referred, actually, in our view, tries to overcome a lot of the criticism that exist about the member state investment instruments that member states have in their bilateral agreements with third countries. So we've already made a huge qualitative strep, step to improve the instrument in order to do away with some of the things that civil society has such difficulty with. In other words, uh, uh, the proceedings have to be transparent in the Canada Agreement. They cannot be done in secret. It's no longer a secret tribunal. The arbitration has to be done in public. Uh, the uh, competence of the arbitrators, the qualitative uh, 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 criteria that are applied, are more rigorous. Uh, but that's not to say, I think, that the Canada Agreement in and of itself is the answer for the EU-US uh, uh, agreement. Firstly, because a number of people in the European Parliament, I think quite correctly, have said that we can still improve on the Canada model. So to the point that, your Canadian, uh, uh, that the Canadian diplomat made to you, uh, it's true, but it's the instrument in the CETA agreement, we believe, uh, 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 could still, at least potentially, be improved further in TTIP. I'm sorry, I'm thinking we're going to have to. We have lost you again. Oh. <laughs> uh, gosh, I'm so sorry. I'm very sorry. Well, that's fine Does, now. It's fine now. <laughs> is it? Yeah. Well, whenever whenever somebody lifts up their hand, 
I will press this button again uh, because every time I press a button here, it seems to improve. Yeah. Uh, okay. So. Okay. Let's well, let's resume again. Yes. So I apologise. Uh, so uh, the, the uh, in in a nutshell, I think what we what we want to do in the next months is to try and identify whether there are further improvements uh, to the Canada model uh, that can be envisaged. One of those, for example, is an appeals mechanism. The, Canada, the Canadian investment uh, instrument does not include an appeals mechanism. There are a number of other uh, further tweaks uh, that uh, we are looking at. And I think that what we then subsequently envisage is really to put the question to the politicians. I mean, I, of course, am a civil servant, so I will defer, well, maybe not to yourselves, uh, but I will defer to uh, uh, the governments of our 28 uh, member states, the members of the European Parliament, uh, and they will defer to you. I mean, that's how, you know, our democracies, uh, our democracies work. So, uh, in a sense, the, the conversation that we are engaged in after uh, the consultation was made public, the study yesterday, is both of a technical nature, so people like myself have to come with technical improvements, uh, and then the politicians like yourselves, and they will may have different views depending on their party, will ultimately say, well, you know, this is something that we think does belong in an agreement with the US, uh, and maybe it, it, it doesn't. I mean, my only point as a technician is that I say, please, let's, let's not look at this only in the context of the transatlantic relation, but let's also look at this in the context of the globalizing world in which we uh, operate, and in which in many third country markets, uh, uh, we have every interest in uh, having an instrument of this kind, because we are an a net exporter of capital, as, as the, the European uh, economy is high value added, it's knowledge intensive. So when we operate on third country markets, whether it's through investments or through sales, we have every interest for our own workers in Europe to protect uh, the assets that we have in those markets and to protect the access that we get through trade agreements to those markets. So when that access is nullified, instruments like these have their place. Now, the legitimate question uh, for politicians is, uh, uh, how can we think this through in the context of the EU-US relationship, where we do have very, very developed legal systems that are independent, that are trustworthy, uh, uh, and that have stood the test of time. And we can all, I think, in America as well as in Europe, be extremely proud of the judicial systems we have. Um, okay, thank you very much. I'm going to open now uh, to, to my colleagues, and if I could ask colleagues to uh, introduce yourself for the, the sake of the record and, um, and for the sake of our guest the, this morning, I'm going to go to Rod Campbell first. Good uh, morning, Mr Huben. My name is Roderick Campbell. I'm MSP for North East Fife. If I may, I'd just like to, to home in on the ISDS point. Um, I think you said a little while ago that by April, May time, you hope to get to the point where, as to a view being taken as to whether or not ISDS would be appropriate in, the, uh, in TTIP. Um, could you just put a little more flesh on what you're hoping to achieve over the next three months? Obviously, at a disadvantage, I haven't as yet seen the, the, the document you've placed on, on the web yesterday outlining the con consultation response, but a little more information on what you're hoping to achieve in the next three months would be helpful. I'm very happy to do that. Uh, and I've been told that you're a lawyer, so uh, uh, no doubt you'll enjoy reading uh, the study or the, uh, the, the report of the consultation, because it, it's, it's quite a lengthy document, uh, but it, inclu it includes an executive summary, but it's quite a lengthy document, but it shows the subtlety, I think, in, an, um, in a very objective way of, uh, you know, both the challenges uh, and the difficulties uh, 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 of navigating our way through uh, 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 um, uh, th these, this conundrum of this, uh, this instrument. What is true, of course, is that this is an instrument that provides a private access uh, to uh, remedies, 
which doesn't yet exist for other stakeholders in a trade agreement. So if you are a labor movement and there's a violation of uh, labor law in a third country, you don't have this private right of access, but you have to go uh, through government to government dispute settlement. So uh, that political criticism which people on the left make is, I think, well-founded that ISDS provides a privileged avenue, legal avenue, for business which is not available for other stakeholders in, uh, in society. However, my reply to that would be still to say that, uh, um, you know, the, the good shouldn't be the enemy of, or the better shouldn't be the enemy of the good, because uh, if you have a labor uh, uh, problem, uh, sorry, you're losing, uh, have, do you have me again? Um, Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello. We can hear you, but there's background noise again. Oh. I'm so sorry. Should we move on? I don't know. I, I really I apologize for this. Um, I really apologize. Connection's gone. Everything's frozen. <coughs> We've lost oh. it. Lost the line. <coughs> okay, we'll remain suspended briefly to see if we can reconnect. Hello? 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 Hi. Okay, so we found each other again. Yes, we did. Okay. Well, okay, well I just asked... Just, just, for the record, just, asked I'll, I'll, just for the record, I'll, I'll resume the committee and allow us to continue with questions. Rod. Yes, and I will, uh, I've asked one of our secretaries to come up so that if there's any further problems that we have... Uh, uh, technical, uh, technical support. I'll just finish my, my reply. Oh no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, it's completely lost you again. <laughs> we can only do this so often. Yeah, should we just suspend? Want to suspend or try once more? they can get some technical support. I think we'll, we'll, suspend, we'll suspend until uh, maybe you've got some technical support and then we can see if we can make a reconnection. Okay, okay, we'll see you soon.
Hello there, this is the technical operator in Edinburgh. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, we're, we're, so still, we're, we're still right, trying to invest... Trying to... Go ahead. We're still trying to investigate this. We're, we think it sounds like it might be a cable problem, um, maybe the cable going from your microphone um, into the wall, maybe it's not connected properly or something like that. You well, could maybe just check your connections. Um, we're doing that as we speak. Uh, what is it? Do you hear a background noise? Or what is it yes, it's, the... it's, it's like um, a frying noise or something like that on top of the, the sound. And it breaks, breaks up, it crackles very loudly. Oh, oh because we, we're looking, we can't see anything here. Um, is there any way you can listen to your own output? Uh, that's a good question. Um, that is a very good question. I mean, just turn it off. It's very difficult. I really do apologize for this. That's okay. These things happen and uh, sometimes they're out with our control. Sorry? No, I don't. I'll get, I'll get Brian from the office. So, so what's this? All right. What's the number? Ah, he's coming. Okay, and where is he coming from? Okay, great. So he'll be there in a minute. Great, thanks. Bye. Okay, so we have a technician who will be here in uh, just a couple of minutes. Sorry, thank you. Yes, Although it sounds, so it sounds you... clean just now. Ah. <laughs> are, you sure, are you sure it is at our end? I mean, I'm, I'm happily to believe that. Huh? Uh, but I'm, we can't see anything here that might be causing the problem. But you've checked all your connections from the microphone yes. to the wall? Yes. Or the <coughs> yes, and we have no, we have no um, phones or things around that could, uh, that could disturb the signal. Uh-huh. Well, we'll wait till your technician comes and see if he or she has a better idea. Right. But now you don't hear any background noise? Is that correct? At the moment, but it continues to build up once you start speaking. It, it kind of slowly ah. comes. Ah, it must be me. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> uh, Dominic, it's David again. Uh, here. Uh, it's David right, again. Here. I can see that there's a conference phone on your desk there. Do you happen to know the number of that, in case we can uh, possibly do the audio yes. over the, the conference so, phone link? Uh, we have a technician who has just come in. Alors, il y a, a un oui, 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 so, yeah, I mean, uh, in the alternative, I think we, we could also use uh, this uh, phone and then uh, use the, the picture. <coughs> The technician says it's the first time he's heard of this problem in this uh, room, room yeah, yeah. that we've not had this before. Uh, maybe, maybe we can uh, lower the, um, the speakers. 
Which one is that? Volume, just the volume. Just to see if it was on the max. Ah, does this help? Um, you can, no. It doesn't? No. It just started as soon as you started speaking. Okay. I start as soon as we start speaking. Ah. Uh. I think we're maybe getting some interference from the other phone. That's not possible. It's not on. It's not on. <coughs> For them, you can hear them correctly. Yes. It's just them who are not yes. listening to us. Yes. So I guess it's a microphone problem. Est-ce que c'est est-ce qu'on si on les rappelle à nouveau est-ce que ça ça peut être coupé rapidement Shall we cut the line and call you back? Call you back just to see. What just to see. Well, it's the same last time you tried. Yes, yeah, uh -huh. they need to call back. They need to. Call. They need to. Uh, can you call us back? What do you want to do? Would you be? Hello. Yeah, hi, we, can, we can try and re-establish the link, but we did that once already, and the problem occurred the second ah. time as well, so I'm not convinced that that was ah. the, the answer. Okay. The last thing we can hey, is could you give us your number so we call you? Okay. Yep, okay. Do you want to give us your number? Yep, um, it would be 0044 131 Three four eight five eight seven five. Okay, we will be calling you uh, shortly. Sorry, are, are you? Do you mean the, the audio phone, or are you going to redial over the uh, the uh, video link? We will try the video link, and then if it's really uh, not working, then maybe. Okay, okay, can, a, a different number. Then can I give you the the. ISDN number for the room zero zero. Yes, give it. Four four. One three one. Three four eight. Six four five zero. So we call this last number. You we call that call last you. number, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hello? Hello? Hello there. It sounds quite... Is this better? It sounds quite clean at the moment, yes. Oh, oh, wonderful. 
Wonderful. So if that works, then um, then uh, we can resume, if you wish. Hi, Hiddo. It's, hi, it's Katie. I'm the clerk to the committee. What I was going to suggest was that we try this one more time. If it fails again, then we'll move over to audio and use your conferencing call facility yes. to get a clean audio, but keep the visual. Um, so, yes. what, so what we'll do is we'll continue. Um, if there's a problem, somebody will raise their hand again, and then we'll suspend the meeting at that point, and then we'll ask you for the telephone number for your conferencing facility, if that's possible. So if you had that number ready, just in case it collapses again. I'll send it to you, Katie. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So, yes. Okay, that's wonderful. So we'll try one last time. If it fails, we'll move to the audio. Okay. Yes. Apologies for this, and thank you for your patience. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we'll just resume the committee now. Yes. Yeah, so I'm, I'm ready to uh, revert back to um, Roderick Campbell's question. Yeah, I was, I was trying to get a flavour, Mr. Huben, of really. Um, a bit more about who was going to be involved in the three months to April to May before a decision is reached as to whether or not ISDS would be appropriate uh, in the uh, treaty. Um, so a bit more information on that you know, and what's planned would be helpful. Yes, and thank you. I think uh, uh, the, uh, the sequence that we envisage currently is that in normal trade negotiations of this kind, we negotiate on behalf of uh, the EU, but we do this uh, in consultation with mainly two bodies. The first is uh, the Council of Member States. Uh, so that means that uh, we will engage uh, both at a technical level, so at my level, but also at a political level, which is the level of the Commissioner and uh, uh, the, the Secretary for Trade in, 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 in London. Um, uh, and that is a discussion that takes place in which member states express their national position. So each member state has to uh, reflect what a government policy is, and that comes together. Uh, and then uh, the usual approach we have uh, in Europe is that decisions are usually guided by qualified uh, majority. Uh, since uh, the latest EU treaty, investment is a European competence, and that means that the European Parliament is fully part and parcel of any deliberative process that we have regarding uh, the uh, 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 negotiations that we are having on TTIP. So uh, our commissioner, because that again is at the political level, she will interact with the European Parliament and notably its trade, uh, its trade committee, uh, and uh, she will have to also engage with David Martin and other uh, MEPs. Uh, David is on the uh, trade committee, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and there, again, different political parties will also express uh, 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 different uh, priorities and different emphases, and the purpose of all of that is to find a balance which uh, uh, is broadly acceptable uh, to uh, uh, a majority of member states and a majority of the parliament. So that, that, that does require uh, uh, quite a lot of engagement uh, between the Commission and these two other institutions. And then lastly, uh, what also uh, is part of our outreach going forwards is uh, outreach with civil society, uh, and we have both formal and informal processes with which we engage with civil society. We have a formal advisory group uh, on TTIP in which civil society is represented. They will be meeting, I believe, the commissioner tomorrow. Uh, they meet on average every six weeks or so, every month, every six weeks. Uh, and we also have larger stakeholder uh, sessions uh, for, for a much larger group because this advisory committee is just 20, I'd say about 20 odd people. Um, and then, uh, uh, of course, uh, what we also do, I mean, my job is, of course, to be open 
uh, to anybody who wants to meet uh, on an issue, whether it's an NGO, whether it's a company, uh, whether it's a law firm. And what we try to do is we try to distill uh, the best possible approaches on, uh, uh, to uh, this uh, question on ISDS in such a way that the politicians can take, uh, can take decisions. And in a nutshell, what has come out of the consultation is that we have identified four questions, and on those four questions, the politicians will have to guide uh, the Commission. And they are uh, the protection of the right to regulate, so uh, investment dispute settlement should not undermine the right of governments to regulate, how that should be defined legally. Uh, the second question is uh, the question of the establishment and functioning of arbitral tribunals. Uh, so again, uh, this is the question of uh, the competence of the arbiters, uh, the public nature of the proceedings, uh, the right of third parties to submit uh, uh, position papers, etc. The third question is a, a, possibly the most complicated one, and that is the relationship between domestic judicial systems and uh, ISDS, which, as you know, is an arbitral uh, proceeding. And so the, the most complex question from a legal uh, uh, point of view is how these two processes interact with each other so that they don't undermine uh, the judicial process that uh, exists in, 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 in your country uh, uh, or in the United States or elsewhere in Europe. And the last uh, uh, a qu a question is this issue of uh, an appellate mechanism uh, uh, which doesn't exist in current investment mechanisms. So this is uh, the possibility like exists, you know, in, in legal proceedings in most uh, uh, of our systems to, 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 to be able to appeal. And those four questions uh, are the key questions on which we will now engage the stakeholders. Uh, and then uh, in that process, we hope, I think, uh, by April, May, uh, to have distilled something uh, that is a political uh, uh, that takes us forward politically. Thank you, Mr. Hooven. Uh, a couple of points arise from that. Obviously, we have a separate legal system in Scotland, and uh, for the record, I ought to put on to refer to my register of interest as a member of the Faculty of Advocates. I take it that you'll be in, inviting a response from representatives of that separate legal system uh, on that third point of that issue in Scotland on this issue before May? Yes. Indeed. Absolutely. And the other thing I would mention, I think Mr. Martin's stated position to date is that he regards IDS as entirely unnecessary between trading partners. So there may be, it will be interesting to see how he responds uh, to the, the four questions posed. Right. Okay, thank you. Right. I think we're getting that interference over the line again, Mr. Hubin. I'm so sorry. Um, if, if we could maybe. Uh, use the conference call and I'll suspend our meeting briefly to allow you to do that. Yes, we'll do that immediately. Could you call us? We've, I think we've set the number. Thank yeah, you. It's okay, we're calling you.
back to the, the questioning. Um, I know that we were scheduled to, to finish with you at 10.30 or 11.30, your time. I don't know how much more time you've got, Mr Hubbin. I am in your hands. You are the elected official, so <laughs> I will stay as long as you wish me. OK, well, we'll resume our uh, committee now and we'll go to Jamie McGregor. Uh, thank you, um, Mr Hubbin. Um, I am a MSP for Highlands and Islands. Um, can you, I'm sorry, if, if my questions uh, cross-cut some of your previous answers, I'm sorry, but due to the confusion, that may be the case. Um, I want to know whether there will be a role for national parliaments in the ratification of TTIP. That's the first question. And the second question is, again, to do with ISDS. Um, can you outline what measures exist in TTIP to ensure that member states retain their right to set policy without the threat of litigation from US companies? Well, those are, those are very good questions. Thank you for that. I think that in terms of your question on the potential mixity, we, that's the legal term we use here in Brussels, uh, of the TTIP agreement, the, the line we take is the following. We are currently negotiating, but we don't yet know what will be in the final agreement. And I think ISDS is a good example because we can't say at this point of time whether it will be inside the agreement or outside the agreement. And the general modus operandi that we have is that we engage the negotiations on the basis of a mandate that we have received from member states, from the council. And on the basis of that mandate, we negotiate. And at the end, when we have a product that we submit for approval to the parliament and to our member states in the council, the lawyers then look at what is in the agreement and determine whether European law provides that it need only be adopted at the European level or that it also needs to be adopted by individual parliaments of the 28 member states. And if the latter is the case, then of course it goes through uh, uh, all of the parliaments. An example, for example, is visas. If there is anything on visa movement of uh, people, of workers, that would make the agreement a mixed agreement. Um, and I think at this stage, what the politicians have said, so at a pay grade above mine, is that this will be decided uh, at the end of the road, but that the scope and importance of the agreement probably implies that we can already anticipate now that it will pass through individual national parliaments as well as the European Parliament and the Council. So that's on that question. On uh, ISDS and the right to regulate, what you may wish to see, to look at, is the text uh, in the Canada Agreement to which Mrs. McKelvey referred, where you will see that there are explicit provisions to protect the right of governments to regulate. I would also add that most, nearly all ISDS procedures are uh, oppose implementing measures of states rather than legislation that countries have adopted. But even if that is the case, the TTIP agreement, if it were to include an ISDS instrument, would explicitly protect the right of states and the EU to regulate. And what is then adopted through a democratic process could not be overturned by a uh, ISDS judgment. So the only thing that an ISDS procedure can lead to is damages for a company that has been negatively affected. It cannot lead to, a, to an overturning of, uh, of the legislation itself in a country, whether this is in the United States or in Europe. Thank you. 
Um, can I just yeah. one more can question? Um, just relating to the, um, th there's been a lot of um, media coverage uh, and speculation in the UK that TTIP could lead to privatisation of the National Health Service. Now, I know in a letter from the Director General to my colleague Ian Duncan, a MEP, uh, he states that the EU approach would not lead to this. But can you, um, would you anticipate uh, there being a specific exemption for health services within TTIP? Yes, well, in legal speak, we call the exemption a reservation. And we will incorporate in TTIP a reservation, which basically does two things. The first is that it provides that the TTIP agreement could never impose an obligation to privatize or liberalize a sector that is under uh, a public uh, uh, funding. But in addition to that, TTIP would also provide that if a government wants to reverse a privatization, it will be free to do that. So it's not just that you cannot be obliged to privatize, but you are also given the additional uh, uh, latitude to be able to reintroduce public uh, funding and, and, and public provision of, 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 of a service, if you wish. I would add that this is also an American interest. So it's not just that as Europeans we are asking for this and the Americans want us to privatize, because there are a significant number of areas where uh, the Americans, well, they call it a different term. It's provision in the exercise of a government monopoly, I think is the term they use in the United States. But they have a similar interest that in areas which they define as wanting to provide a service publicly, that that should be possible and that the treaty itself could not impose an obligation that would, uh, uh, that would limit that in any way. I'm grateful for those clear answers. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Adam Ingram. Thank you, Con convener. Uh, morning, Mr. Huben. Adam Ingram, I'm MSP for Carrick Cumnet and Doon Valley, which is in Ayrshire in the west of Scotland. Uh, I'd like to ask a nitty gritty question about the economic impact of TTIP. Um, much is claimed uh, for TTIP in terms of economic growth and uh, jobs benefits. But if truth be told, uh, it's a bit hit and miss, is it not? For every job gained here in Scotland from, say, lower tariffs on knitwear, we could lose several others in financial services or food and drink with increased competition from the USA. So there'll be winners and losers across e economic sectors, will there not? So predicting outcomes from complex trade negotiations and agreements are a guessing game, are they not? You can't, you can't guarantee anything by way of economic benefits. Well, that's a good question. I think how we look at it as trade specialists uh, when we look at a process of liberalization, and that is what at heart we are trying to do here. The Americans will liberalize sectors that benefit from some protection, and we will do the same, and those sectors may not be the same. Uh, the, the usual economic assessment is that the, uh, the costs are concentrated and the benefits are spread out. So... Uh, Sectors that uh, lose out to international competition, uh, and there have been many in the last decades, uh, th there are always losers when there is liberalization. And that's why it is rightly uh, for politicians to decide for or against an agreement of this, of this, of this kind. In our policies in Europe, of course, we try to have uh, mitigating mechanisms that allow the economy to adjust because our 
long-term philosophy is that overall we benefit from openness. And of course, Europe as a continent and its individual member states, uh, you could say we invented international trade over the last centuries, whether it is uh, the Spanish, uh, Venice, uh, the UK, I'm Dutch, uh, it's, in, it's in our veins, even though the Americans may claim that they have taken on the mantle of competitiveness. There are always costs to liberalization, but liberalization helps you compete and protects you over the longer term because it enables you to have uh, what we have in Europe, which is a very strong knowledge base and uh, a competitive economy. Liberalization in and of itself doesn't need to lead to long-term unemployment. If you look at America today, for example, it's a very open economy. Their unemployment is below 6%. So uh, if we have unemployment in Europe, which is unacceptably high, and it is too high, I think everybody agrees on that, certainly here in Brussels in our analysis, it's not trade policy which is at the source of that unemployment. And we have to take other measures that help to reduce the unemployment. But that's not to say that there won't be losers to a process of liberalization. I would not be telling you truth to you if I suggested otherwise. Yes, yeah, so we're not just talking about trade flows here. We're talking about capital flows and one of the outcomes of uh, international trade agreements, for example, in North America, with the NAFTA agreement, there was a flow of capital from the US to Mexico, which is a low-wage economy. Now, uh, there are concerns here, for example, we want to have a high-wage economy. We're not looking for that kind of investment, but we are concerned. We do have a lot of American investment, US investment in Scotland, and could we actually lose some of that as a consequence of this, this agreement? I think your questions are legitimate. Um, the economic modeling suggests that there would be an increase both in trade and in reciprocal foreign investment. And what distinguishes the relationship between Europe and America from all other parts of the world is two things. Firstly, that our trade historically has been more or less balanced. So we import as much to each other as we export to each other. This is very different with China. It's very different with Russia. It's very different with India, with whom we have large imbalances. Over the longer term, in the relationship with uh, the United States, there is this deep perception of fairness and of mutual benefit. So that's the first point. And the second point is, uh, sorry, I've lost my, uh, uh, my thought. Um, I have to apologize. I'm just past 50, so I've lost my, uh, my, my, uh, so the, uh, yes, no, the second is on the investment stock, in, excuse me, in response to your question. Compared to any other region with the world, of the world, what defines the transatlantic relationship is the depth of our reciprocal investment stock. So we invest more in each other's economies than anywhere else in the world. Our relationship with China, for example, is much more a trading relationship rather than an investment relationship. The relationship with America, arguably, is more an investment relationship than a trading relationship. So it's a very, very deep uh, relationship that until now provides for mutual benefits. And I think it is this perception of a shared interest that we think that TTIP can help us compete better against the rest of the world because there are 4 billion people who have joined the market economy since 1990. They're all in Asia. They have lots of standards of protection which are lower than ours. And 
if with the United States we can help each other to increase the competitiveness of our economies, we will better be able to face the, the, the competition challenge that we are together facing from Asia. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm not entirely convinced by your answers, but uh, wait to, and also wait till you hit 60, and then you'll have something to complain about. <laughs> okay. Flash back to the convener. Uh, Willie Coffey. Thank you very much, Next. convener. Uh, good morning, Mr. Huben. Um, I'm uh, Willie Coffey. I'm the member of the Parliament for the constituency of Kilmarnock and the Irvine Valley, which is in Ayrshire. Um, could I return to the question that was asked of you by my colleague Jamie McGregor and it relates to access to Scotland's health care services once again. Could I ask you the question in a different manner perhaps? What are the circumstances that might allow access to Scotland's publicly funded health care services? I know you said that the TTIP cannot impose this but are there any circumstances where it could still happen. Right. I mean, what I'm told by my colleague uh, Miranda, who is a seconded uh, UK official working in the, the Commission, is that you have a specific situation in Scotland in which any decision to tender out certain activities would have to be taken by the Scottish Parliament. Now, none of that would be changed by TTIP. Uh, in both directions, so both in terms of a decision you as a parliament may take to contract out and any subsequent decision that a later government may take uh, to contract in if you want to uh, turn back any privatization measure that you have uh, taken before. So if there are market experiments a government wants to take anywhere in Europe, uh, they are uh, they can be made, but if uh, uh, in addition uh, you have an election, a new government comes in and they wish to reverse a privatization, that will also be possible. Now the only point I think on which you can have a discussion between trade policy experts is whether if you decide to open up the market, whether there should then be non-discrimination, between an American bidder and a European bidder. That is trade policy business. But the choice of whether or not you wish to exercise a monopoly uh, in public policy, that is and will remain yours as a national parliament or as a government. Let, let me just ask you to clarify that. Are you telling me that the Scottish government could prevent access to our publicly funded health services, even if the United Kingdom government decided to open them up through TTIP? Yes. Hmm. At least That's... as far as TTIP is concerned. I, I don't know but... the specificities of your uh, uh, constitutional relationship with the UK, but hmm. TTIP will not in any way affect the relationship between Scotland and the UK. That, so that, if you can do it in your constitutional relationship, TTIP would not in any way put a hurdle on that. But the competence here lies with the United Kingdom government, doesn't it? Should it decide otherwise, that's where the decision would rest. Is that not the case? My, my, the only point I am able to make to you is that TTIP would not impact that. Okay. Okay. Th thank you very much for that. I'll let other members ask a question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hans Alla. Uh, good morning, Mr. Hoban. 
thank you for being so patient, and uh, I really appreciated your input this morning. I, I wanted to ask you something that we are very passionate about, and that's education in Scotland. We have a, a very historic uh, institution of education, and we are, we've always encouraged education for people to come to Scotland for education, and in particular the U.S., uh, and, and we enjoy a very warm and very friendly relationship in that. I'm wondering that uh, with uh, TTIP, is there going to be any additional burdens or restrictions on how we continue that relationship in terms of, one, the number of students, two, the value of fees, and three, uh, whether they would be entitled to engage in other activities uh, while they're students here. Will there be any uh, impact on that for our industry? Uh, the short answer to that is no. The longer answer to that is that we will try through TTIB to make any facilitating measures that would foster such exchange. For example, by encouraging a mutual recognition of diplomas. So that, uh, for example, if you go and study in America but you want to practice afterwards in Scotland, that your American diploma can be recognized in Europe and vice versa. So TTIP will try, again, it's not yet clear whether you know, we, we will be successful in that, but TTIP will try to encourage uh, the recognition of diplomas. And for workers, we may also try to improve mobility so that if you want to work on the American market currently, it's very difficult to get a, 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 a visa to work. And if the Americans agree, we would be very interested in having measures that facilitate the exchange of workers because we think that would appeal to young, notably to young people. Uh, but again, that is something where we are still at the beginning of this negotiation and we don't know uh, whether there will be appetite for this uh, uh, going forward. In terms of fees and charges, uh, I don't think that TTIP in any way impacts uh, either your system in, in Scotland or the very diverse system of private and public education that they have in the United States. Right. Uh, that sounds helpful, and I, I use the word cautionary, sounds helpful, because um, in terms of visas for students to come and go, uh, the freedom of the, 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 to exercise that, and, and also in terms of allowing the students to work in the host country, because also that's not only helpful financially, but it's also helpful in terms of understanding or getting a greater understanding of the culture of Europe and America. So uh, I'm just uh, trying to tease out the, 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 whether there's going to be any restrictions in that and whether this is going to be open to national uh, members to make those decisions or will it be done central in Europe? And if it's going to be done in central Europe, we, I'm wondering what the process of lobbying would be to try and ensure that we have a satisfactory outcome in the issue. Right. Uh, I, I can only offer this, which is that if any progress is made on these issues, it will have to fully involve the national level because this is not a European competence. So if member states and the European Parliament see promise in trying to improve the mobility of students or workers and the, the, the rapidity with which they can access each other's markets so that you have uh, a, a European person who is qualified who can work in, uh, in America, and possibly also that the partner of the per person is allowed to work. I mean, all of these attendant uh, conditions are also very important. Uh, whether we can move forward on that depends on a green light from member states, because this is a national competence. So we will be looking very carefully for guidance, because uh, we're very attentive to what is a European competence and what uh, we depend on for, for the member state level. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Anne.
Thank you, convener, and good morning, Mr. Huben, and thank you for your patience. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure if I'm the unlucky omen in, in the committee. This is my first day within the committee. Um, my name is Anne McTaggart. I'm an MSP from Glasgow. And this, as I say, this is my first day within the committee as I have just been um, selected to be the Shadow Minister for Europe and International Development. So I'm keen to hear all that you've had to say this morning. But can I ask um, about some of the standards questions? Um, how the EU's higher agricultural and food standards, which oppose extra costs to the European farmers, can be protected under TTIP? Well, I, you ask a, a hugely uh, difficult question because next to the investment instrument, I think the, the question of food standards is, uh, is the most controversial one in, in, in TTIP. Our position, as we have, I think, articulated it, is that we are not going to change, through TTIP, our legislation on, for example, genetically modified foods or organisms. We are not going to change the ban we have uh, on injecting cattle with hormones in order to make them grow more quickly, which is a current practice in the United States. All of those uh, practices in the food chain will not be up for negotiation in TTIP. However, TTIP will uh, provide for greater access for products that we are allowed to share on each other's market. So the border protection will uh, uh, be uh, reduced, and that will allow more exports from the European uh, uh, farmers to the U.S. market and vice versa. Uh, and I would add that uh, in the agricultural trade, we have a net surplus with the United States since a number of years. So we think that in the end, there are very significant export interests of Europe uh, uh, in in, 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 in negotiation and not just defensive interests. Thank you, Mr. Huben, for your answer. Um, could I possibly ex extend on, on that answer and ask about what discussions, decisions have been made or agreed um, regarding the setting of standards within other industries and trade agreements? And uh, taking it out with the agricultural and the food standards? Yes, it, it, that is uh, a, a question that is difficult to answer because in the field of standards, there are certain things that we are not doing and there are certain things that we are wanting to do. So uh, where our standards are fundamentally different, like, for example, in how we treat chemicals, TTIP will not bring about change. But where standards lead to redundancies and to higher costs for our industry, there we are trying to find common outcomes. So, for example, in the field of car safety standards, these are different in America and Europe, and they lead to a huge unnecessary burden on car factories, because if they produce a car that is exported to the U.S., it has to uh, respect safety requirements, which in practice lead to the same level of safety, but the car has to be built completely differently. And there we are trying to find mechanisms of mutual recognition. But in the field of chemicals, for example, we have legislation called REACH in Europe, which provides for the registration of hazardous chemicals. The United States don't have that. And that is not going to change. They are not going to adopt our system, and we are not going to adopt theirs. So that's still a thorny issue then that has to be um, negotiated and ironed out. Correct. So there you see that in the end, 
uh, it, the negotiation is not a mathematical thing, but it's really a, more of an art in which on both sides we have to identify the areas where we can make our standards more compatible. And in some cases we will succeed and in some cases we will not. So thereafter, that could be about reducing standards? Could be about lowering standards. No, I think uh, what both sides have said quite clearly is that there is never going to be a lowering of standards, never. But what we can have is through cross-sharing uh, of information, we can have standards that are more intelligent and more compatible. But the only direction is up. That's super. Thank you very much, Mr Holman. That's what I was hoping to hear. Thank you. Thanks, Katina. Jamie McGregor. Just, uh, thank you. Just on that point, Mr Hubel, um, I, I understand that in written evidence to the committee, Ian Duncan MEP referred to comments made by the German agriculture Mr. Chris, uh, minister, Christian Schmidt, suggesting that the protected food name schemes will be removed under TTIP. And this would, would be very um, bad for Scotland, uh, you know, with our Scotch lamb and Stornoway black pudding and other um, very important um, uh, products. And um, I, I just wondered what your comments might be on that. Yes, well, that's a very good uh, question. I have to say I'm very impressed by uh, the level of your questions. I think the German minister in the meantime has qualified those comments uh, and they were referred to the difficulties that your products or other products with what we call geographic indications in our technical speak in Brussels, uh, so Parmaham, cheeses uh, and the like, uh, they are insufficiently protected in America. They are only protected by the trademark system. Uh, whereas in Europe we have specific geographic indication protection, which is a higher level of protection. And through TTIP, we are trying to export in a certain way some of that extra protection that we, uh, that we uh, uh, give in Europe. And we're not going to get everything because the Americans don't like it, but we will get certainly an improvement on the U.S. market in comparison to the current situation. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, Mr. Huben. It's just went on to 11 o'clock, and I think, um, you know, given all our technical problems this morning, I wonder if you would mind if our committee has some additional questions for you that we um, send them to you um, in the hope that you can maybe answer some more detail on some of the things that we've maybe not managed to cover this morning. Would that be acceptable to you? Ab absolutely, and I think... Uh this unfortunate experience with the video confirms that the next time either one of my colleagues or myself should come over to Edinburgh or you should come over here and, um, uh, and speak to us uh, in person. Yeah, I think maybe that's, that's uh, the best way to do things. But we're, we're sorry about the technical uh, challenges this morning and we really appreciate your time and your candour uh, and your openness. And um, hopefully this will be a conversation that we can continue um, as we uh, uh, go through our deliberations on TTIP and its, its implications on Scotland. But for the committee's point of view this morning, can I thank you very much. And, and as I say, we look forward to, to hearing from you again and hopefully seeing you in Edinburgh soon. Thank you. Absolutely, and thanks to you. It was a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Thank you. very much. <laughs> okay, that, that finishes that section of our um, deliberations this morning. Um, I'd now like to close this meeting and remind members that our next meeting is on the 22nd of January, where we will take um, evidence from Jackie Minor um, on the European Commission's work programme. Thank you very much.